Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, good evening. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My name's Jake. My sobriety date is February 16th, 2011, and my home group is Monday Night Madness at Club 3333. It's down on... 3333 West Columbus Drive in Tampa. Um, it really is an honor to, uh, to to share my story with you guys, man. And, and for those of you that uh, um, that that responded to my uh, to my text yesterday, thank you guys for coming out, man. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the rest of y'all being here to uh, to, to hear me because uh, it's been my experience that uh, that I truly can only keep what I have, and that's my sobriety by giving it away. And I hope that what the, the words I say tonight can help someone tonight in some way, shape, or form. So, um. Just a little bit of backstory about myself. Uh, I um, I was born in Illinois back in uh, 1980. Uh, my parents are immigrants from a country in Central America called Panama. Not this, not the party city, but the actual country, Panama. And um, we lived in Chicago for a little bit, and uh, moved back. Da- I moved down here to Florida, where they decided to pursue. You know, real estate was getting big back then and stuff for Florida. So. Um, you know, I grew up in a pretty loving family. Like I, you know, I, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't at a loss for anything really, but, um, I always wanted more. I always wanted more than what, uh, than what I had. And that was from like, before I even thought about picking up a drink or a drug. Um, you know, I, I remember, um, you know, I grew up playing with transformers and GoBots and GI Joes and I guess, uh, Ghostbusters, they had little toys, and, you know, uh, my friends and I, we'd, like, you know, make them fight each other and stuff, and those were real fun times, man. Um, and I remember spending a lot of time in my head. I, uh, I spent a lot of time escaping, you know, I used, uh, I, and I see that in myself today as a result of this program, um, that, uh, you know, whether I would have picked up a, uh, a drink at the age of, uh, you know, 16 or a drug at the age of 14 or decided to wait till I was 35 or 40 or 30 to do that, um, I had this disease. I had this disease long before I had, I've, I've had this disease before I even probably was conceived is the way I see it. Um, but, uh, so just ca- kind of going back a little bit to my, uh, uh, to my childhood and stuff, you know, I, I typical kid playing baseball, playing outside with my friends and all that. And, um, I always wanted, uh, uh I, I always had that, that feeling of, um, of not, not good enough, less than, you know, I always wanted to be one of the cool kids or whatever. I always wanted to be like uh, a part of the cool kids crowd. Little did I know I was cool the whole time, but, you know, as a, uh, um, as a person with alcoholism, part of my, uh, part of my disease uh, tells me that, um, that I'm, the, I'm better than that guy over there, but in a room full of people where we're all equal, I can still feel less than. And I, I would drink or drug just to get on an even, even keel, not even, you know, feeling better than, but I, I had to drink or drug just to where I was on a level, level playing field, so to speak, socially or whatever, the, you know, whatever the case was. Um, so, uh, you know, life was going on. I started getting in trouble in school because I was trying to be cool, you know, started skipping school and smoking cigarettes, hanging out, hanging out with the cool kids, smoking cigarettes or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, my, uh, uh, my parents clearly saw that, uh, uh you know, the, the, I guess the direction I was heading in, the, the approval seeking type thing was, uh, it, they saw the danger, but they couldn't, you know, you couldn't tell me anything. You really, you know, you couldn't tell me anything. I, I thought I knew it all. I thought that, um, you know, I, I thought that, uh, that I knew what I wanted and what I wanted was just to be cool, so to speak, you know, hang out with the girls and, uh, party with the boys, whatever, you know? Um, so we'll fast forward to the age of, uh, uh the age of 14. I did my first drug. I was LSD. You know, I, I guess I went straight to it. Um, and, uh, um, uh, I actually, you know, I actually went out and, and, uh, and, and I was seeking, you know, they, they had this say, just say no to drugs program. It's called Mendez or Dare or something. And I remember, uh, um, I was like, Oh, I'll never do drugs. And I was like, Ooh, you know, what's, you know, they're talking about hallucinations. And I was like, yeah, you know, talking about people flying and all that. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to, th- th- this goes back to my escapism, that whole escape and getting out of myself, man. And that's what this disease is all about. Whether it's, 
uh, for me, my experience, uh, whether it's it's a, a bottle of Patron, um, you know, vodka. I was a, I loved vodka, beer, good microbrew, Xanax, oxycodone, cocaine, whatever. Um, my disease wears many masks, and it will use um, and uh, and twist. Uh, twist around my perception, you know, they say in the doctor's opinion that um, um, the sensation is so elusive, uh, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And, um, you know, as soon as, as soon as I picked up that, um, at first, my mood-altering substance, man, that forever uh, changed my perception as to how I saw reality. My alcoholic life was the only normal one. Um, you know, so I, I smoked pot, and, uh, you know, then, and I prided myself on not drinking. I was like, oh, I don't drink beer. I don't drink, you know, liquor. That's for losers, whatever, you know, like, because that's what I thought was cool. So, um, you know, we go on to the age of, uh, uh, the age of 16, I picked up my first, uh, my first beer, and man, I'll tell you what, alcohol was like, became my new best friend, and it became a staple of my life until I got sober. Um, you know, alcohol truly uh, was the beginning of, of allowing a mind mood altering substance, which I have no control. Once I put that first drink or drug in my body, I'm off to the races. Um, you know, the, the doctor describes it perfectly here. He says these allergic types can never safely use alcohol um, in any form at all, and that for me includes drugs. Uh, once having uh, once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, you know, the, uh, once having lost their self confidence, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly astonishingly difficult to solve. You know, once I started drinking, man, I was uh, I was stealing beer, stealing, going to the liquor store. They used to have these pants called Jinkos um, back you know back when I was growing up, and they had big pockets. So I'd go in and and uh, you know I would uh, I shoplift liquor because that's where my disease took me, man. I uh, and so I eventually got. Um, uh, my friends and I got arrested for doing a, uh, a beer run when I was like 18. So I, um, I decided it was a great idea because my disease gives me lots of great ideas. So my great idea was I should just get a fake ID. Get a fake ID not to steal beer anymore. So, um, you know, needless to say, being 18 years old, um, actually, no, I had the fake ID when I was 17. And, um, but I, just, you know, for, for, for whatever reason, um, when I was 19 is when I got caught with it. And um, I, uh, I, I was, you know, say that coolness that I was looking for the whole time, if you're, if you're a young person under the age of 21 who can buy beer, you're like a god, basically. And anyone, you know, I'm not, I know this is being recorded, but I really don't care. Anyone who, uh, anyone who's had that experience can know that I, I was the go-to guy, so to speak, um, for all that. And um, um, what was I going to say? But, yeah, going back to the effect of, uh, of, of alcohol, man. Alcohol did for me, truly did for me what I could not do for myself, man. It made me, uh, it took away that, uh, that uh, again, it put me, I felt like it put me on a level, on a level playing field with everybody else. I didn't feel like that, that social anxiety or, you know, being afraid to talk to that girl over there or, uh, or, or relate to these guys over here, whatever. I could, you know, when I started drinking, man, I could, I was everybody's best friend. Um, and, uh. You know, little, little did I realize that the fact that I was drinking faster than my friends, drinking more than my friends in a very short period of time, you would have thought that, uh, you know, hey, maybe, and my friends were telling me, dude, you need to slow down, man, you know, and I was just like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Meanwhile, I'm blacking out, throwing up at parties, you know, and this is a common, this may be a common experience, but for, uh, uh, for me, man, I, it's clear to me, I should have known back then, but this disease is so cunning, baffling, and powerful, I couldn't differentiate, like we just talked about a minute ago, the true from the false. Um, I truly, truly believe that, uh, that alcohol was like, hey, alcohol is my higher power. For a long time, man, alcohol and drugs were, were my higher power. That's what I worshipped. Maybe not literally, you know, bound down or whatever, but like in all my actions, all my whole lifestyle was centered around, you know, where the party was at. And I didn't want to go to any party where there wasn't some sort of drinking or, or partying going on. Um, um, there got to be a point, it says here in Bill's story, liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Liquor was a luxury for me for a long time. It was a luxury that um, I had a, I had a lot of money in my liquor account or credits or whatever. But um, there came a time, and I don't know when that time was. And um, actually, I do know when that time was. It was the day I was born um, was when uh, um, liquor was a necessity. I mean, before I even... Um, before I could even realize that, that I truly did at my core, before I, I could see that I had a problem and that I am an alcoholic, I was already way, 
way far gone, man. Um, but yeah, just kind of going back through my, um, through, through, um, the last decade, I guess. I, um, when I was, I think 20, I ended up, uh, um, I was, I was really big, like I told you, I was really big in the party scene around here, like raving, like raves and stuff, glow sticks, techno music, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and along with that came, you know, other, other drugs, like ecstasy. I, uh, I, I did ecstasy, lots of it. Um, and, um, you know, and I was mixing that. At, at this point, you know, I loved alcohol so much that I could not do it without doing something else. So it was like, I was mixing, mixing drugs and alcohol and whatever form my flavor of the month was i was uh, um i was mixing those things despite what i'd heard don't drink on ecstasy you could die yeah right not me you know i got this not me no um so uh, we'll go to the dying part later on but um um you know bill talks about uh renewing my resolve i tried again there were some times i definitely faced some consequences as a result of my drinking and my drugging and i and i said I made these promises to myself, like, um, um, oh, actually, I was talking with a friend earlier. You know, I had some brief moments of clarity that uh, uh, when I was really uh, a combination, and this happened a few times, no matter what the substance was, um, that uh, I saw myself, I think it was God speaking to me or my spirit speaking to me, telling me that I don't have to live like this. That, and I saw myself being, like, completely happy without uh, any minor mood-altering substances in my life. But as quick as that that desire to uh, to be happy without any of this external crap, you know, drugs and alcohol. Um, my disease, again, without a spiritual solution, uh, they, they talk about uh, failing to enlarge our, our spiritual lives. Um, without enlarging my spiritual life and establishing that connection with God, man, I was screwed, dude. I mean, it was a matter of time till, like till I was... I picked right back up, man. No matter what my desire was to be happy and to be a, uh, a productive member of society, or just even, not even of society, but just for myself, just to have peace within myself, just to be comfortable in my own skin, man. Um, they talk about here that mind and body are marvelous mechanisms. Um, for mine, endure this agony two more years. I mean, I, uh, I endure the agony of, of alcoholism. I still endure it today. However, I have a solution to deal with it. That's the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, man. Those steps save my, save my butt. They save my life. Um, but uh, as far as uh, trying to do this with no solution, no spiritual solution, it's for me, it's impossible, man. And the reason why I know it's impossible is because I tried every other way. My parents tried to send me to military school when they found, you know, they they knew, you know, when you're doing LSD and smoking pot and drinking beer, you're going to look. For me, I know I looked tweaked. I must look crazy coming home sometimes. Remember, I drank a whole bottle of Robitussin on uh, uh, one day coming back home. Well, that's where my disease took me, man. You know, seriously, I say this in all honesty, man, um, that uh, my, the day my mom wanted me to talk to a priest, my parents being from a, a, a Latin country, they're hardcore Catholics, like hardcore, like I used to call them Catholics, you know, um, they were constant church retreats, constant, like, you know, just like I was bombarded and, um, with, uh, with lots of religion. And, um, I, uh, I was supposed to talk to this priest one day and, um, I drank a bottle of Robitussin and, and got out of it somehow because I, I was like, Oh, I'm sick. And I was sick. Cause I peeked my guts out at, at PE. Um, so, um, um, going back to the, uh, you know, the mind and body are truly marvelous mechanisms because uh, the body will adapt to whatever, you know, because I, uh, as a human being, my, I have a survival mechanism, in my, that's my mind, and it will adapt to what, okay, basically drugs and alcohol are poison, but it'll process that poison and make me more resilient to it. That's what we call a tolerance. So my tolerance for drugs and alcohol went way up. And, um, but still, I was still getting more doing, doing the same amount that my friends were doing over, let's say over like at the period of hour. I was doing that within like 20 minutes. You know, that's just how, how, uh, ravenous and how rapacious, uh, this, this, uh, disease is, man. So, um, you know, I was doing, uh, I was, I got into, to harder drugs later on in, in my, uh, in my twenties, man. And my, my drinking truly took off into like new, like, where I thought, you know, if I when I was 16, I couldn't see myself, you know, staying out all night drinking for for days straight, or mixing drugs so I could drink more, or whatever combination I felt I needed to do because that was my solution. That's how I that's how I dealt with life because I didn't I had so much, uh, you know, shame, guilt, and just a complete disdain for my spirit for myself. That uh, drugs and alcohol, alcohol took me out of myself. It allowed me to deal with the re uh, with with my reality as I saw it, man. And um, I uh, I was able to to live life as as unmanageable as my life was. It allowed me to 
survive um, in my own head. So uh, I got a job in the finance um, finance industry. You know, Florida, the Hillsborough County experienced a big mortgage boom back a few years ago. Um, like, oh, two to like, oh, eight, I think is when everything fell apart. Um, and, um, you know, that's that was probably the worst job, the worst field that I could have taken, you know, that, that I, I could have put uh, my – I guess my uh, my eggs, the worst basket I could put my eggs in. Um, you know, I was going to school, but because I was drinking and drugging, I was like, you know, I, I wasn't showing up to like, uh, like I remember I missed a final because I uh, uh, I forgot that I had it. I forgot that I had it. I was out drinking the night before, and um, I forgot that I had the final. And then later on, and you know, again, Silkworth talks about, um, just real quick, um, where does he say it? Oh, yeah. Um, I've had many men who, for example, this dude told, these cats have told my story before I was even born, which amazes me about this book um, and about this program. I've had a, a peri- a many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem, like my class, or business deal, which was to be settled on a certain date, finals day, for example, favorably to them. Um, they took a drink or day or so prior to the date, the night before, um, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important, important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. And um, I can give numerous examples of that, but I won't get into that. I will just say that, uh, um, that not only did alcohol do for me what I couldn't do for myself, it, uh, it prevented me for doing, from doing for me what I could do for myself. Um, so, um, you know, they talk about suicide here, and uh, it just reminds me of death. You know, I, and despite having friends die over the years, you know, um, I remember um, – I remember a person I used to skip school with, um, you know, we we used to drink and drug, go to the store, steal cigarettes is when they had cigarettes out, you know, on the aisle. And I used to go down, put quartz down my shirt because I needed to get a drink because that, that taste, I craved the taste of alcohol. Um, you know, it was like burning the back of my throat. Like I needed to have it. Um, I remember, you know, we'd skip school and, you know, and and drink and drug. And I remember hearing that, uh, that he died, you know, he, he, Stop breathing, asphyxiated, or whatever. You slumped over the steering wheel and couldn't breathe. Actually, isn't now. You know, when I do that, I can't breathe. So I imagine if I passed out of a steering wheel on Xanax, it's pretty easy to die. And um, you know, this disease takes out so many people. Just thinking about that, man. But still, yet yeah, knowing about all the deaths that I've that I've had to deal with with friends. Um, and uh, my aunt, she was an alcoholic, so that's one. And I know for a fact that on my dad's side, my, my I think it skipped my parents and got to me. It's basically what happened. Um, and uh, um, you know, despite knowing all all that, you know, not even self knowledge, but knowledge of others who have died, that wouldn't keep me from drinking or drugging. Not me, man. Not me. I got this. You know, like again, an egomaniac, which my ego is huge, and that's what this, the twelve steps help me to do is to deflate my ego so God can work through me, so my so I can choose to let Him work through me. Um, but um, you know, moving forward from there, man, um, self knowledge. You know, knowing. Uh, Knowing that I'm an alcoholic, um, in and of itself, is not going to keep me sober. Um, knowing that uh, that I have this thing they call the phenomenon of craving and the obsession, you know, that I have to, when I put a drink or a drug in my body, that I immediately, that that switch, that light switch gets flipped on, and I'm like a, a freaking, uh, I don't even know what, like a, like uh, like a piranha or something, I don't know, or like, I, I don't know what example to give, man, or like, you know, like, I'm just, I'm just on it, dude, you know, I gotta find my next fix or whatever, and for me, because, um, because the phenomena I crave, because I suffer from that phenomena I crave, it doesn't know any, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate for me between alcohol and a drug, if one's not around, I'm doing something else, because that's how I deal with reality, that's, that's what my solution, without a spiritual solution, that's what my, that's what my solution is, to pick up a drink or a drug, that's what I know how to do. Um, you know, we kind of go back to that uh, that survival thing about the mind and body being marvelous mechanisms. Well, you know, it, it's something that it's something that my mind, that my body feels that it's good. My body not having its own uh, computer system like its mind does, it's going to keep seeking that out. So um, um, even knowing about that, knowing about the consequences that uh, um, that alcohol would make me endure i still drank and drug man and i and it got worse the wor- uh the more consequences i had the more i think that life's rules didn't apply to me um you know i was i was terminally unique i guess and that's what uh, um and that self-confidence man that self-confidence you know they talk about um i remember i was at a meeting the other day and we were in the 12 and 12 and it was talking about self-confidence being um a total liability 
you know, I was confident in things that I was good at. Um, you know, for example, I, I play music and I enjoy writing music and stuff like that. I started a few bands around Tampa or whatever, and I was extremely confident with that. Um, I was confident with, um, with, with sales. I was confident with, uh, you know, selling, you know, going out to meet somebody, you know, I, I, I rarely didn't not, if I met a person face to face, I rarely didn't make that deal happen. But I'll tell you what, man. Um, you know, and among other things, so there's, there's tons of gifts that each person, speaking of which, that reminds me, alcoholics in general, I think we are a very gifted bunch, man. We are very gifted people, more so than the average, not average, but than the 90%. Who don't have my disease? We're extremely good to people, but this is like a, you know, to make a cross reference to something I won't say directly, but it's like this is like the thorn in my side, you know, so to speak. Um, without, and actually, I can't say the rest of that without getting too much into some spiritual stuff that may not apply or that. So I'll just keep it based. Uh, you know, I, it's been my experience. Every alcoholic I've met has been extremely gifted and talented. But um, because I suffer from this disease, and it's a, it's a trifold disease, the body, mind, and spirit, as we all know, can only be attacked to the spirit by God. That's what the 12 steps do. It allows my, myself, separate from this person, myself, my ego, so that God can, you know, do his thing, man. Um I think I was just talking about it. I have, a lot, I have a lot of main points in my head, so if I jump around a little bit, please excuse me. Um, I forgot what I was just saying. So um, um, it was about, uh, oh, alcoholics being gifted. But, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, which I guess I'll find out when I die, <laughs> I mean, I have this. But it's, it's such a blessing, man, because um, having spiritual principles that I can apply, not just, you know, um, the program for me, and not only – uh, it not only gives me a reprieve, it not only solved my drinking and drug problem, man, but it's my solution for life. It really is, man. I mean, for life in general. Um, I can apply these principles anywhere. And, and you know, we talk about the 12th step. Having, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, um, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics, to other cats who suffer from what I suffer from, from what you suffer from, and so on and so forth, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. You know, when I practice something, for me, when I practice something, that means I want to get better at it. That means uh, if I practice something long enough, I intuitively know what to do when um, when a situation arises where that principle's to be called on. You know, but uh, um, thankfully God allows me to make mistakes today that won't cause me to go out and drink or drug because I have that spiritual toolkit. I have I have a solution today. I have tools. I got my sponsor, my network of people. I have um, helping other alcoholics. I have going to meetings, man. I mean, meeting makers don't always make it. So that you can for me that does not apply. Meeting makers do not always make it, but step workers they step up and they keep it. And going to meetings helps with all that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, going back to that spiritual toolkit real quick, um, you know, and applying these principles, I can see where today and uh, um, the awareness that comes from um, from living the steps, man, it allows me to see where my ego, maybe not all, all maybe not on time when, it, when I need to apply that principle, but later on, you know, I can say, OK, man, you know, why am I spiritually disturbed? Oh, it's because I was, I was take, basically taking action out of fear. I was being selfish. I was holding on to a resentment, and that made me blind, you know. Um, oh, speaking of resentments, let me go to that real quick. Um, you know, they talk about resent, resentments being the dubious luxury of, uh, um, uh, of normal men. That's that 90% that we're just talking about who don't have my disease. Um, they say it, like, really well in here. Uh, from it stem all forms of spiritual disease, for we have not only uh, not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. Um, and um, for me, man, I remember, you know, my uh, uh, when I was in uh, when I was in kindergarten, I remember I gave myself a reverse Mr. T haircut, cause Mr. He, T, the A team and all that. And, um, I cut my hair like, like this way. And, and my, my mom picked me up from school. She said, what happened to you? You know, like, and I was like, this is the fear. This lets me know that I was an alcoholic way before I even picked up a drink. He did it. I blame him. Some poor kid. That like had nothing. I, I didn't even know who this kid was. I just pointed to the first kid that I could think of to take the, you know, again that that, that approval seeking, that that character defect or approval seeking, and uh, being dishonest. At the age of six, I was telling my mom that some kid cut my hair when I gave myself a, ver a reverse Mr. T haircut, and um, you know, that's just that's just an example, man, of uh, um of how insane my disease is. And it says it's plain that a life which leads to deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. And um before I knew even knew that I was hanging on to resentments, man, they were poisoning me. I uh um I remember um when I was twenty, I was working for um I was working for this this uh, uh IT company. And um I remember I was holding on to a lot of resentments, man, from uh that I 
I collected my resentments like baseball cards, man. And every now and again, it, if I was sober, I would uh, um, the, the brief period of time where I was sober, and that was usually when I ran out of stuff or when I was I hadn't picked up yet. This is before I crossed the line. Um, you know, I just get pissed off, man. I was a very extremely angry person, very destructive too. I used to break stuff because that's you know if I didn't have a drink or a drug or if I was drunk or whatever or high, I break stuff because you know I, I like the sound of breaking glass or whatever it was, you know, um, and um, you know, that's just, just crazy stuff, man. Um, so, and I was a very unhappy person. I remember flipping my car. Um, I was on my way to work, hungover, mind you. Uh, there's a play or a, a road, Hoover Boulevard. I worked off of um, this Anderson and Hoover Boulevard. There's this company called Detronix, Wang Global. They're out of business now. And um, I, uh, I going back to, uh, to alcoholics being good to people, and we're a very determined bunch as well. When we want something... I mean, for me, I'll speak for myself. When I want something to happen, I'm going to make it happen. I'm like a freaking bull in a china closet, dude. And um, so I I, uh, I was driving around this Ford Escort, and um, you because know, it wasn't and my car wasn't good. Now, first, the problem was was that I didn't have a car. Um, it was it was always something outside of myself that I was seeking. Um, you know, nothing was ever good enough for me. I always had to have something more. I always had to keep up with the people around me. And um, and to do that, the best way I knew how to do that and to make things happen was to drink and drug, and that would allow me to you know make money or whatever. It was like my crutch. Um, so I remember being hung over and driving to, uh, uh, and driving to work and, um, going and, and, uh, this is where that not caring about life, you know, this disease cunning, back and powerful. It's wanting to take me out however it can. And it will use, um, it will use people, places and things to take me out. Um, however it can, man, in, in this particular instance, um, and I was hung over driving, driving to work, I was going about a hundred and 20. There's this game called Gran Turismo. I used to play a lot. It's a video game about racing cars or whatever. You get to soup up your car. So um, this is back when Acuras and Hondas and Nissans and all stuff were real big in Tampa. Was, street racing was a big problem. And I um, I was going like 100. And, it was like 100. First I was going 100. And I used to take this curve all the time. You know, like, you know, my car's lower. It's like good suspension and all that. And I remember... Uh, um, this feeling just not caring whether I lived or not, um, just washing over me, you know, coupled out with a hangover, that's, that's not good. So, um, I ended up taking, uh, taking the, the, the curve, it was like an S curve, and I, well, however that's shaped, and I took the, uh, took the curve too sharply, clipped the, uh, my wheels clipped the, the curb, and, um, I was saved by two palm trees, according to witnesses that saw it, this was like at eight in the morning or whatever, and, um, I remember, uh, um, Everything, everything went black, but I had a, 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 and I know what I saw. I know I've dropped acid and done, done drugs and drank a lot, but I know what I saw. I know exactly what I saw. It was, and I remember this to this day. I remember seeing the scene of all that stuff happen, you know, what happened. And I remember seeing, like, it was like a bird's eye view that was like a, it's like a topographic map. If you, you know, the lower the degrees are, the, the, the more detail you see, but, um, when you, you know, the bigger the degrees get, the more you can see. It was like, basically, I was like this. I was seeing my spirit. I know what I saw. My spirit saw everything, and then I blacked out, and I woke up. Firefighters slapped me in the face, um, you know, telling me how lucky I am to be alive. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys, I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. My sunroof was up. I had the windows down. It was a little, little Acura Integra. So I, I should be, that was one of the many times where I should have been dead. And um, I remember, uh, and I, I split my lip, and every time I'll go out drinking after that, my lip would, like, swell up. And, then, you know, I was like, whatever, you know. But um, I remember being in the hospital, man, and seeing my reflection in the, uh, in the, the x-ray machine or whatever and just breaking down man not because of the the pain of my lip or whatever but the the spiritual pain that bankruptcy that i was starting to feel man but um it still wasn't that bad yet it still was not that bad that was not enough to keep me to, to tell me that i had a problem but you know why though because again i failed to enlarge my spiritual life any period of sobriety that i think that i had in the past um on self on my own willpower was really you know, they talk about a boy whistling in the dark. <laughs> That's all that was. Um, because without a solution, man, I'm doomed to, uh, um, to, to act out until I pick up a drink or a drug. That's my experience. So, um, you know, I, uh, um, again, started, uh, uh, started moving on to even harder drugs while still drinking. And, um, and just the consequences, man, I started getting to where, like, I couldn't, uh, you know, I go out and I couldn't pee. I have to, you know, men have to stand up and pee. Um, so I, I couldn't, I couldn't pee at the bar because my body was shutting down. The little diarrhea, I couldn't swallow water. I couldn't swallow my own saliva, but it still wasn't that bad. 
Still was not that bad. Um, I just rationalized it to, uh, uh, you know, it's this, so I got to do something else to mix it, you know, w uh, with the drink. And then eventually got to where, okay, well, maybe I just shouldn't drink tonight, but I'll do this instead. Eventually, alcohol in and of itself did stop working for me physically, but if it was, if I didn't have any, any drugs around, I definitely would pick up a drink um, in order to, you know, in order to just deal with life on life's terms. Um, so uh, um, my, my disease just was taking me to places uh, to where I was, uh, I was beginning to, to really engage in activities without saying much more about it that, uh, that I would never dream of doing today in order to, to, to keep, you know, uh, to keep the necessity alive. Um, you know, we talk about liquor being a luxury and becoming necessity. Well, at this point, it was like a outright, like it was like, if I had the choice between getting food or, you know, toilet paper or paying my bills, I was going to do drugs and then, or drink, and I would have that, that, uh, that insanity, okay, well, I'll replace the money. I'll make it happen somehow, you know, like, I'll, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, and I'll have these crazy ideas that there's no way that I could put a plan of action into it, but, um, you know, still, my disease is so cunning that it will lie to me, um, and tell me that I can, uh, that, that my life isn't as unmanageable as I think it is, which is just a straight up lie. Um, so, uh, let's see, I lost more friends to this disease, and that still wasn't enough to keep me, um, to keep me keep me sober by any means, I ended up getting a DUI. There's a place called Peabody's in, uh, over in New Tampa. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I was drinking and I was drugging that day. I was heading back home and, um, ended up getting, uh, uh, getting pulled over. And I had a resentment against these cops for like forever. Cause, uh, until I worked, you know, until I did a fourth step on it, cause it was, it was, everything was always the world's fault. It was never, I never looked at myself as being, uh, and my selfishness really as being the cause for, uh, for my life's I don't know what, just for me not being happy, you know, um, I refused to listen to, uh, uh, to God who kept trying to nudge me in the direction, you know, cause God really does, whether I believed in God or not. Um, and I have always believed in God, but I can say that he is not, I wasn't his friend like I am today. He's always been my friend. He's always been there for me. Um, but, uh, until an alcoholics anonymous, which I think from the depths of my soul to my heart and to my mind, man, I thank Alcoholics Anonymous for bringing me back to God because uh, that's what keeps me sober at the end of the day. All these things that I do, um, you know, praying in the morning, praying at night, working with others, sharing at meetings, helping other alcoholics wherever possible, and trying to practice this stuff, all it is is just letting him do the work and me keeping my own ego down because I think I'm so badass I can do any and everything. Um, without this program, man, I will think that and by all scientific measures, I should be a dead man right now. Um, so um, I'll skip ahead a little bit here. It says here, um, it's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. A subtle foe is like a ninja waiting in the shadows in broad daylight that I don't see who comes up to me and freaking, you know, pat, cuts me in half, basically. That's what the disease. I've managed to, to put together a couple, you know, stints of sobriety. I was dry as hell. You know, I had no, no happiness. I was miserable, even though I was still going out and being socially active, when I got home, man, I, I didn't like, I didn't like myself. I didn't even like my friends, you know, cause, cause I was, so, if I don't like myself, how can I like other people? Um, and, uh, you know, without, without this program, man, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time. If I don't enlarge my spiritual life or in the past, when I hadn't enlarged my spiritual life, it was only a matter of time. I thought that maybe I was being sober or living sober or whatever I thought I was doing. But, um, not only did I pick up right where I left off at, you know, but it, I, I got worse. Like they talk about this disease is progressive. I mean, this disease and for a guy, I'll just speak for myself, man. It was like exponential, dude. Like where I left off at, maybe I left off it down here and then I stopped for a period of time. Okay. I started again. I was here. And then within like a week or two, I was like, you know, like, up to, you know, past, I was already drowning, man. So, um, a bunch of events happened, um, uh, that led me to, um, led me to, to wanting to voluntarily, you know, we talk about more, more about alcoholism. One of the many things that I've done besides changing my brand to liquor, changing whatever, um, whatever drug I was doing or changing my, my surroundings, I need to live in South Tampa. Okay. South Tampa's not good enough. I need to live over in New Tampa. Okay. New Tampa's not good enough. I need to buy a house. Whatever it is I thought that I needed outside of myself to, uh, to be, um, to be happy. Um, 
it was all farce, man. Um, I think I was going over to, uh, yeah, more about alcoholism where it talks about, um, I know exactly what I'm looking for, so just give me a second. And, um, uh, let this page 30, um, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, voluntarily commit, uh, accepting voluntary commitment to asylum. So, you know, today, to me, an asylum is detox. Um, I, I voluntarily, at, at the request of my friends and family who were super concerned about me, like, you know, you have a problem. You know, you need to do something. And I'm like, no, I don't. You guys need to do something. You know, like, get away. Now let me go get drunk or high or whatever it was. Leave me alone. Um, cunning, baffling, powerful. So I checked myself into detox and um, uh, voluntarily, and they brought AA meetings in there, and I wasn't ready to hear. This program, for me, it didn't work until I, my, my spirit was crushed to the point to where, like, I was just out of ideas, and I was out of my, my self-confidence no longer, you know, I had no more confidence in myself where this drinking and drugging thing was concerned, man. And that was extremely important, man, because the delusion that we're like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. And it took for me, man, it took for me... God just doing for me what I couldn't do for myself, man, and that's to concede to my innermost self that not not only conceding to my most innermost self that I'm an alcoholic, but to actually do something about it, to be willing to do something about it, and be willing to believe. You know, the steps are in order in my experience for a reason, man, and it's the reason why they're in order is divinely inspired. So I go from um, you know, I go from saying, okay, I don't got this, to okay, well then who does? You know, it's like there's. Our power, or our lack of power is our dilemma, but where are we to find this power? We talk about it and we agnostics, and, um, you know, where am I to find this power? Well, it says in our reading as well, I think, is this our preamble? Or is this the, uh, um, I don't have it. Oh, can you, can you pass me that thing down there? Oh, actually, this says in how it works, too, but I'll just read it from here. Um, you know, our personal adventures, which is you're here in my personal adventure today, and after, before and after, make clear three pertinent ideas, which I will 150% say is true in my life, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives, B, that probably no human being could relieve us of our alcoholism. That means even going to detox and talking to a doctor, you know, or shrink or whatever, seeing a shrink like I have in the past or seeing a priest or whatever could relieve me of my alcoholism. And then here, here's the kicker, man, that God could and would if he were sought. And that is the... Dude, if that's not a promise right there, I don't know what is. And God, um, you know, we talk about uh, uh, God's like can be, can be very, you know, the two things in the AA I've noticed that kind of, you know, God and sex. Those are the two things people, the two subjects people kind of are like, oh, you know, I don't want to talk about that. But, you know, just kind of focusing on God here, man. Um, he's always done for me what I couldn't do for myself when I allowed him to. You know, when, I, when, um, when I'm willing to take the actions to do the footwork, you know, do the footwork to let him work through me, man. I'm still sober today, man, so I'm very thankful for that. So we know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. So, you know, um, I had a little break in detox. The second time I went to detox, I took a, I took a, took a break, and that's all I needed was some time off. You know, I just need a little break. So um, I, uh, I, I OD'd the day I got out of detox, having had heard everything, ha having heard people's stories, you know, they bring, they bring uh, story, uh, bring meetings into, uh, having, having heard the truth that I wasn't prepared to hear because my disease still, uh, still had me by, had me by my balls, basically. Um, I, uh, I OD the day I got out of detox and then, um, my, uh, I, my grandmother found me in the bathroom with both shoulders out, seized foaming at the mouth. And, um, I had to go to the hospital to get my, uh, to get my shoulder put back in place. I snapped out of it and that still, it still wasn't that bad. I could have woken up at that time. I could have died and opened my eyes up in a whole nother, whole nother reality, a whole nother dimension, whatever happens when people die. And that still was not enough to keep me from, um, keep me from going back out. And that's exactly what I did because that was my solution without enlarging my spiritual life. Um, without having spiritual principles in my life, man, that's what I'm going to do. Cause that's what I know how to do. I did it for the last you know, 16, 17 years. And, you know, that became intuitive. I practiced getting high. I practiced getting drunk. I practiced manipulating people. I practiced hanging on to resentments and I practice, uh, uh, my disease helped me the practicing all the things that keep me sick. Um, so if over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. Well, um, by the grace of God, man, um, my uh, a buddy of mine who had um, who had recovered from um, from from addiction, um, he told my dad he heard about what I was up to. I began using drugs intravenously and drinking and all that, and um, he approached my dad because he heard about what I was doing, and um, 
my parents were just, and I, you know, we say, uh, I, I always said, I'm not hurting, you know, these people, you know, it, whenever it did come up, I usually wasn't thinking about anybody else but myself, but, um, whenever it did come up that you're hurting other people, no, I'm not, I'm getting, I'm, I'm doing my thing over here, you're over there, leave me alone, you know, and, um, my parents were, they were, uh, I'd gone from being somewhat self-sufficient, you know, having a car, having a place, having a job to like, you know, drugs and alcohol, um, you know, they took such a place in my life, such a priority that I justified, um, justified not paying my bills, um, to get drunk and to get high. I justified, um, not doing the things, not, not having a job. Basically I justified, you know, work was taken away from time that I could be partying. Basically, that's where it got. Because to me, my my life, my alcoholic life was normal. It was perfectly normal. Those losers over there going to work don't know what they're missing out on. I have a solution here. Maybe that's not what I said, but that's like kind of the feeling that I had. Um, so uh, ended up getting, I got in a lot of bar fights, you know, drinking and drugging, um, and ended up uh, getting into a fight. Uh, like in back last year, not last year, what's this year, 2012, so in 2010. And, um, again, this is like the week after I OD'd and my soldiers were out of my socket or whatever. So I got my ass whooped, um, cause my shoulder popped out and I tried to throw a punch. And, um, but I, and it wasn't that bad because I still had a solution and I was alcohol and drugs and, um, ended up going to the Salvation Army and seeing the intake counselor there. And, um, you know, he could clearly see that I was like in a lot of spiritual pain. He could clearly see that I was freaking hurting, man. And um, I was, man. And I was, I was okay at that point in my life with dying. I was cool with dying in my disease. I was perfectly all right with that because that was better than living without drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, and um, it took me like another two or three times to get into the uh, to get into the treatment program there because uh, I was just out there still, man. I, I, my, my disease again. That was my old operating system. God was not my operating system. Um, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, but more importantly, those 12 steps weren't part of my operating system. My operating system was to get to get out of myself, to escape from my reality. Um, so I ended up going into, um, uh, I ended up getting marchman acted. That's where people, you know, that love you or your friends or whoever say, this dude's off the chain. He needs help, and he's not going to do it himself or he's going to die. And um, I had such resentment against those that were trying to help me that um, I ended up uh, – um, I, I, the, the thought actually crossed my mind. This is my insanity to, to, to get a fake passport and move to Canada so I could keep on partying to avoid treatment. That's how cunning, baffling, and powerful my, my disease for this person is. And um, went to treatment, man, and, and that's uh, – uh, you know, I, I finally surrendered to the program, man. And, and um, you know, I knew I was done. I knew I was done because – got to points where I just knew I was going to die. I knew, but at this point, it wasn't a matter of me being okay with dying. I was no longer okay with dying in my, in my alcoholism. So, um, I found a solution, man. That solution, man, again, is those 12 steps. Um, I remember being completely hopeless and this is what it took for me to, to, to surrender to God and surrender this program was just being utterly hopeless and broken. Um, I remember being in my, uh, in my dorm and, um, just, just, not knowing what was going on, knowing that my ideas were no longer, you know, they weren't working. So I got on my knees. I intuitively knew, you know, even, you know, I talked to God in foxhole prayers and to pray for things that I wanted, that my, that my ego wanted. And if it was good for me, he gave it to me. And if it wasn't good for me, another higher power that I'm not going to mention out loud gave it to me. Because uh, I do believe that my disease does answer to a higher power. But um, that's a whole other topic. But, um, you know, I ended up reaching out to God, um, just asking him to... Asking him just to direct me. I don't know what Alcoholics Anonymous was or Narcotics Anonymous or Recovery. I don't know how I would even live the rest of my life without, you know, picking up another drink or a drug. But little did I know, this program is a daily program. It starts from the time I wake up and the, from the time I, uh, at the time I go to sleep. When I wake up, I thank God for another day sober and I do the things. I, I allow him to direct me to do the things I need to do to stay sober. And at night, I thank him to show me another alcoholic I can help. If I do that, the days eventually pile up. The days add up and... You know, it's it's crazy to think about how this disease will trick me into thinking that I truly do need um, uh, to get out of myself via mind mood altering substances um, in order to be okay with myself. And um, it's amazing how when I when I do what God wants me to do, God as I understand Him, as I understand Him, everyone in here has their own. You're free to choose your own conception of God. That's the beauty of this program, man. I don't have to have the God that my parents try to tell me about or that the, you know, the Catholics, the Baptists, or this church, or that church, the Buddhists, or whatever. No, it's my personal relationship with God. And then 
I, and then I grow in that as I enlarge my spiritual life throughout throughout this journey. Um, and that's the thing. Like, if I'm working the principles, I enjoy actually growing spiritually. It's like a, you know, it's it's weird how that works. But um, I uh, I went to the Salvation Army and I, I did the steps, or you know, I worked the steps with my first sponsor. The fourth step, um, I, uh, I I left some stuff off the fourth step because my ego. My disease was still trying to get me drunk, and um, I did the rest of my fifth step. Um, my conscience, after I completed the, the 12 steps to the best of my ability, I realized, you know, something happened when I um, when I had the spiritual awakening or bursts of a spiritual awakening. That was my conscience came back, that honesty came back, and um, I knew that I had to get the rest. The rest of my fifth step, the stuff that was going to get me drunk for sure is the sun shines and the water's wet. I was going to get drunk if I didn't do the rest of my fifth step. But I did, man, and, and God's amazing, man. I really do. I'm very appreciative of this program. But, um, you know, we talk about character defects, shortcomings, making amends, and all that stuff is extremely important for me. Um, and prayer, meditation, I mean, all those principles on the wall, again, um, you notice I've said God a lot here because that truly is, man, when I had my back to God, he was still with me, but he couldn't, I wasn't allowing him to take the steering wheel. There's no way that I was going to let him have it, because I, I had this. Um, and uh, as soon as I let him take over, man, I, you know, life's gotten amazing, dude. You know, to be alive right now, to be even standing here talking to you guys, I, I really appreciate life for its, you know, for its, uh, I realize, I've realized my own mortality more. My parents are getting old. My grandma's like 91, or she'll be 90 this year. You know, my sister's in California. My best friend lives out in, on the West Coast. And, uh, um, you know, we're all our own little individual, on our individual paths throughout life, man. Life is just so amazing that uh, I truly allowed my ego. Um, but I have this disease. So, you know, I don't know why things are, they just are, but... I feel on the one hand, sometimes I feel like I was, uh, like I was robbed of my, you know, the best years of my life. But then I think, Hey, I'm sober now. I'm staying sober. And if as long as I, they say, you know, we have a lot of sayings in here, trust God, clean house and help others. Dude, life's just began for me since I've gotten sober, man. It really has like, you know, uh, I'm having a spiritual awakening right now. Just talk to you guys. Seriously, I'm like, I'm aware of like, you know, just being again, being alive is such a, a gift, man. Because uh, I came close to death a few times, and um, you know, I could easily died. And like I said before, man, woken up in some other place. And um, so I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, it says here, uh, practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with all their other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. And that's the, in my experience, man, I'm thankful for all the sponsors that I've had, even the guys that, you know, I get into the fourth step and they're like, oh, see ya. You know, even the guys that are, um, that BS me, yeah, you're, you're, you're great. I want you to be my sponsor. I'm always wary when guys tell me that at first because then I'm like, you know, like, I'm like, okay, is this person going to stick around? Sometimes they do and then sometimes they don't. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's such an amazing way of life, man. It really is. And working with other alcoholics, I, and that's, we talk about getting connected with God, man. If God, if the image of God is within each person that's alive, that means that God speaks through uh, other people. Um, and um, I stay connected to God by helping another person, by getting out of myself, myself being that separate entity within myself, within me, um, that, will, that wants to get me drunk and will tell me sometimes that I'm not an alcoholic. You know, you just went through a phase or whatever lie my disease will try to tell me. Thank God I have, uh, I have the truth. Spiritual principles, courtesy of the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, man. I have, I have the truth now today to see where, um, see where it's just a lie. Um, I don't know what to say, man. If, uh, uh, if y'all saw my intake picture when I went to treatment, I had, I had this crack fro out to here and a beard down to here. I looked like old dirty bastard that just got into a fight with like two pit bulls and a giraffe or something, man. I don't even know. Um, but, uh, you know, and that was just because I didn't care. I, I didn't want to look in the mirror. The only time I looked in the mirror was to brush my tongue while I was brushing my teeth, and that's it. You know, I just didn't care. Wore the same clothes for days on end. You know, what a, what an alcoholic does. Um, today, man, I I, uh, I I love myself, and I'm able to love others. I'm able to help others because I love myself. Um, I have a new partner, and that's God, my creator, man. That's uh, That's really... I do the footwork, and he keeps me sober, man. Um, 
that's that's a solution, dude. That really is. So um, I really appreciate, I truly appreciate you guys letting me share my story with you, man. It's uh, um, it's helped me. I hope what if something I've said maybe may have jumped out to someone. And um, thanks for helping me stay sober today. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.